I don't think any of us realized what was going on. I mean, there we were, day after day, week after week, month after month, actually year after year, season after season, we were being with Jesus 24-7, 365. For three plus years, we were around Jesus. But I don't think we understood what was happening. We were getting an education. We were getting discipled. We were getting trained for the kingdom and what the kingdom of God is all about. But none of us really realized that. And he talked about things that we didn't understand. He kept bringing up things that we, were, we would be confused about. And we kept asking about his parables. He would just keep telling us things that so often went over our heads. But being with them was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Day after day, watching how he treated people. How he treated women with respect and honor and dignity, not like others. He raised them up, had conversation with them, looked them in their eyes. How he treated the poor, the outcasts. He treated them like they were the only person that mattered. Treated children, treated children like they were special, that he wanted to be with them anytime, every time. We as adult men, we just didn't quite get that. It wasn't that way. We weren't raised that way. But every time Jesus encountered anybody, he was present with them. How he dealt with the diseased and the infirmed. How he dealt with the blind and he just touched them and they saw they had sight. The hearing, the deaf, he gave them hearing. The speechless, he gave them voice. The dead, he raised. He was so involved with their lives in every way. It was like he encountered a person and it was him and that person and they were all that mattered for the moment. He gave them all of himself. He loved them unconditionally. He treated them with honor and dignity, not like others would do. He treated us the same way. Each of the 12 of us, he saw us unique. He saw us as we were. He saw beyond whatever pretense that we presented. He loved us as we were, as we are. With all of our junk and our stuff, he just loved us. <laughs> James and John, they were big. They were big men with big mouths and big heads and big egos and big beards and big bellies and big laughs and big voices. They were just big. They were big. Everywhere they went were big. And since there was two of them, wherever they showed up, they just overwhelmed the room, the place, the gathering. As soon as they showed up, everyone knew, James and John are here. Everyone. And they were, but they were bold. They were bold for God. They were willing to speak what some of us were too timid to speak. And when they spoke, everyone listened. Even if we didn't, didn't agree, we certainly wouldn't disagree because of how big their presence was. Everyone except, except Jesus. He didn't agree with anyone unless he truly agreed, unless it was truth. He agreed with truth every time. Every time. But sometimes people wanted things and he wasn't about to be coerced or manipulated. I'll never forget learning what they had done. I mean, I trusted them. I looked up to them. They were big and bold. They were, they were among the brethren. They were ones to, that I loved. And yet, I never expected that they would manipulate something. But one day they did. One day they had a private audience with Jesus. We did everything together with Jesus. I mean, somebody, he pulled James and John, Peter. He pulled them outside for certain things. But, but this time they pulled him off. It was different. And you know what's interesting? They didn't just pull him off to be with them. They pulled him off and brought their mommy too. <laughs> so lonely. They brought, they brought their mom because they had a special request that they wanted to make without the rest of us hearing it. Because they knew what would happen. And what it did happen. It ticked us all off when we found out. Every one of us were enraged and says, how in the world could you possibly do that? But they did. So they pulled Jesus off the side. They say, Jesus, we want you to do for us what we ask you to do. Okay? <laughs> now, if you're a mom and a dad, you know never let a kid do that to you. <laughs> whatever I'm going to ask you, you say yes, and then I'll tell you what it is I want. Yeah, well, that's what they did. Jesus, we're, we're, we want you to do whatever we ask, and we're not going to tell you what it is. And he says, well, what do you want? They said, well, we want you to set us on your right and on your left in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't really know what you're, ask, you're asking. You don't understand. And then he asked them a question. He says, 
Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? You know what they said? Yes, we can. <laughs> Remember, they're big, bold, and mad. This is the boys. This is the sons of thunder. We call them the dynamic duo, the dunamis duo, because they were just explosive in power. I said, can you? They said, yes. And he said, well, boys, I hate to tell you this, but uh, what you're asking for isn't even within my power because it's already been set aside for someone else. When we heard about it, the ten of us, we're all just ticked off. How in the world could they do that? But then you know what I, we realized? I realized I was ticked, not because they had a private audience, not because they brought mommy, not because, besides mommy, you realize was Mary's sister. That was his aunt. That was a trump card. That's the queen of hearts that they brought there to persuade Jesus. And she asked the same thing they did. But it ticked me off because why should they get first and second chair? What, what about me? Shouldn't I get first and second chair? Why, why, did, why didn't we vote on this? And, you know, take a vote to see which one of us was most popular among the disciples. I mean, that would have been a fair way to do it, not this underhanded stuff. But I go back and think, Jesus didn't play favorites. He treated me the same way he treated everyone. With honest, humble, penetrating into our souls, love, kindness, compassion. I'll never forget finding that out. I'll never forget the rage that it raised up. And yet the Lord helped settle it in my heart. First Baptist, it's a privilege for me to be here with you. I want to thank you for letting me have the opportunity to kind of bring the narrative of what we're going to study. That just kind of is the backdrop. We're going to study that very same passage and a couple of other passages. But you know, I, I saw what your, um, it's in your bulletin. Unfortunately, I don't have the bulletin right here, but I have it right here. Your purpose statement is, wait, how, where is it? Um, there it is. A relational church that is sold out for Jesus. When I saw that, I went, wow, that's good. And I just sat there and kind of meditated on it for a few minutes, and I thought, that's Pastor Bill. A relational man who's sold out for Jesus, that's Pastor Bill. That, that's ex exactly who he is. You know, I met him right here in this room, right in that room right there, right there. About eight, seven and a half years ago, I was invited to a pastor's gathering for the first time. I, I don't know if any, did any, did you know anyone? Was I the only new kid on the block? Uh, no, we were both. Okay, so no, we didn't know each other, and uh, uh, Pastor Jack asked us to, to gather together and invited me to come, and we met here, right there in that room, right there, and I remember driving up here. See, I've been a, lot, I've been a pastor for a long time. I know what pastors do. I know, I know how you, know, you can kind of stretch your stuff and let everybody know how cool you are and whatever you're, you're doing, and I just thought, I don't have any time for that. I don't want to be around that. If these guys are that kind of guys, I'm one and done. I'm one and done. I'm, I mean, I'll come. Hi, guys. Bless you. I'm out. Never see you again. That would be just fine with me. That's where I was. And I come in there and I sit in that room. And, I, and I'm hurting at the time. My, my world is really uh, in a bad place. A bad place. And so we, you know, they asked, who are you and what are you about and so on. And we began to share. And I got really honest and real. But I didn't know if they would. But they did too. They all got honest and real. Every one of them. And I remember that day leaving here going, these are real, honest-to-God men who love him and are transparent with life, and they're humble. And, I want, and I'm not saying this because I'm saying it in front of Bill. I want you to know the truth. They were all humble, but he stood out to me as the humble among the humble. He did. I left her knowing this man is real, real. And they were too. I, we still meet with these guys, and the others have added to, uh, added to our group. And we've been meeting now for seven plus years, and it's transformed my life. These men, I love them. They are my friends. They are sharing life with me. And and uh, when I thought about not being a pastor for uh, now, I thought, am I going to lose these guys? And they've assured me I'm still welcome, even though I'm not in a senior lead position. So thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Bill and the guys. But this purpose statement that you have, a relational church, that's why I was so excited when I found out I get to come here and speak to you guys and know who you are. If this is who you are, God bless you. 
be that across the street and down at the restaurant right here in the gas station and in this community everywhere. Be, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> Snuck up behind me. Be that everywhere. So would you right now open your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're in this study about, about uh, disciple making and how we're making disciples like Jesus made disciples. So turn to Mark chapter 10 and look at verse 32. What just happened uh, probably last week's study is that you were looking at Jesus making a pretty awesome statement. He said that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that rattled their cages. Why? Because they know that in their standard of living, if you have got money, if you've got wealth, if you have prestige, if you've got prestige, that means God's blessed you. And if you've got God's blessing and you can't get to heaven, then how in the world will I, without prestige and blessing, get to heaven? They were rattled. And so pick up with me in verse 32. They, the disciples, were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. So this really rattled everybody. And this is again. Now, in Mark, this is the third time, but we don't know how many times he's actually done it. In Mark, it's the third time. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We, guys, disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man, which is me, in case you're not paying attention, guys, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will, look at this little list, will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. And then it says, then. He's just told them for the third time at least, if not the sixth time or the twelfth time, I'm getting ready to die. We're headed to Jerusalem. Tomorrow morning, break of day, we get up, we start walking to Jerusalem. You understand what's going on? I'm going to my death. That's what's happening. And all this other stuff's going to happen. He's letting him know, and it says, and then, then, the word then just pops up in my face going, what do you mean, then? Right then. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, came to him. Teacher, <laughs> rabbi, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. Selfish little snots. Oh, that's not in the scripture. That's my paraphrase. So don't, don't look for those words. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? We can. <laughs> oh, boy. They answered. Jesus said to them, you will. Well, this is a wake-up call. You will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard it about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, to me, it's just, it's just shocking. There's so much in this passage. We could spend weeks here, but we're going to go quick. It's just shocking to me that right when Jesus says, again, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit on. I am going to be flogged, and I'm going to die and rise again. Right then, James, John, and Mommy show up. Hey, we got a request. We want chocolate chip cookies. We want something for us. And, and it's, for, it's all about us. It's all about this. And I, I look at them and I go, you selfish, self-centered, snot-nosed brats. And as I'm pointing the finger, I realize I'm pointing right in the mirror at a man named Dennis Larkin. Because I'm a selfish, snot-nosed brat too. See, I, I don't want to be, but I, I, I want what I want. And my wants get in the way of the will of God. So I have to pray, God, here's what I want. But God, would you supersede my want? I'm, I'm taking my wants and offering to them to you and asking you, put thy will be done. Put thy kingdom come. Put that on top of my wants so that hopefully my wants will melt away and I will want what you want. You understand what I want? That's a position of humility. But I'm just the same snot-nosed brat that those guys were. I have my wants. And, and, and so what I realized in this study is that when my wants become more important than God's wants, I am not humble. I am proud filled because I am saying, God, I really know more than you do. I'm actually smarter than you and I know what's best for me. And doesn't that sound pretty snot-nosed brat, doesn't it? Okay, so I don't know if I'm looking at any more than just one. I know there's one snot-nosed brat in this room. I just don't know if there's more than that. But maybe there's another one in here. So I see them as self-centers and, and I find myself the same way. Now, let me ask you a question. Seems like a side note, but it's really not. Raise your hand if you struggle with this. Do you struggle at all with your 
prayer life with God. If you do, just raise your hand. We're not going to ask you to tell us what a bad prayer person you are. Come on, how many of you, put it up there. Be, don't do this, do this. Put it up there for a moment. I struggle with prayer. Okay, put your hands down. I'm glad I'm not the only one, but I am right now in this season as stepping down from senior lead position in the church to becoming a missionary full time. I am in a time where my prayer life is really struggling. You know what I'm struggling about? I'm struggling about my money. Because I know, okay, I'm supposed to, I can raise up to this amount. And right now I've raised up to like 20%. And, and I, go off, I go off the meal ticket plan um, at the church on June 30th. So I've got a little ways to go, right? Now I'm not telling you so that you'll give to me. Please, don't, please do not hear the motive, that motive. Here's what I'm saying. I go to tell God, you know, hey God, you know, I really need. And as I start to say, I really need, I think, well, I'm going to tell God what I need? <laughs> Seriously? How? How full of self am I to say, God, here's what I need. I mean, don't you know, God, that I'm at 20%, I need to be at 100% before June 30. God, are you paying attention? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So I start, go to pray and I say, well, God, I need, and I just shut up. I was like, oh. And so in that tension, there's also where the scripture says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And, and, and that ask is an ask I-N-G. So ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. It's an it's a, it's a ongoing concept. So I'm to ask and seek and knock regularly. The Bible tells us to bring your, your prayers and petitions before the Lord, and he will give you peace. And I, so, so I don't have peace. So I'm going to fix the peace by telling God what he needs to do. You see the tension? Do you see that? So I'm trying to go, okay, God, hmm, you know I'm so limited in everything, my ability to comprehend, my ability to trust. So here I am. I'm going to tell you what I think I need, but dear God, please put on top of that your will. And if you choose that our resources become less and less and less, that's fine. I'm just, so I, this conversation I'm having, God, I'm just trying to trust you in it. And that's my struggle with prayer. And maybe you have a struggle with prayer too. You talk to God and you tell him what you want. Maybe you sound like one of those, the, the Zebedee boys, you know, a little more self-centered. Maybe you are. And that's where we need to deal with the humble side of life. They came to God, and they said, hey, God, let's, let's make a deal. <laughs> I love it, because I've done the same thing. Okay, God, listen, if you'll get me out of this jam, I'll never. Right. You prayed that prayer, huh? Some of you know that prayer, right? Or, or God, if I stop doing this, then you'll give me that, right? Okay, we, we try to negotiate with God. He's not in the business of negotiation. He didn't do that. God is in the business of transformation, not negotiation. They said, Lord, let us sit on your right hand and on your left. What were they asking for? They wanted prestige, honor, pride. Look who I am. I'm first chair and, I'm, and my brother's second chair or vice versa. I mean, look who we are. We, it's me and Jesus, my bro. That's us. We're cool. Jesus wanted me to do that. The issue is pride. He wants to sit at the head table. But I want you to understand this. This is the, con, this is the, the flip of the concept. You and I were created for a great purpose. And, 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 and when you look in the mirror, the man that you're shaving, the woman whose hair you styled this morning, when you see that person, you may forget what you were created for. So let me remind you. You and I were created to give him honor and glory. We were created to live a life in such a way that he's honored and glorified in whatever we say and do because we're doing what he created us to do. You know, a fish swims and a porpoise swims and eagle flies and they're doing what they were created to do. And that brings honor and glory of plant blossoms and blooms and bears fruit or flower or whatever. It's bringing honor and glory to the one that created. And you and I were created to bring him honor and glory forever and ever. And so when we live our life, as long as it's surrendered underneath him, he's the Lord and I'm the follower, we bring him honor and glory. But we get in that situation where we want mine. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask a question of me, and you might ask the same question of you, but I'll just do it for me. Dennis Larkin, what do you deserve? Hmm. Some of you got it. You get it, right? See, I know what I deserve. I have committed so many sins against the holy God of the universe, the creator, the redeemer, the lover of my soul. I've committed sin since before I knew him as my Savior and Lord, after I've known him as a pastor, as a leader, as a husband, as a father, as I have committed so many sins. I have just, I'm the greatest sinner at my church, by the way. That's a true statement. It really is. And I don't know I'm the greatest sinner at your church, too. So now you know who you're listening to. You ought to just get up and walk out. <laughs> but that being said... I know what I deserve. I deserve damnation. I deserve eternal separation from the God of this universe. That's what I deserve. 
And then God comes along and he says, Dennis, I still, in the midst of all your stuff, in the mess that you are, I love you. And I'm redeeming you. And I'm bringing you into my family. I'm going to call you son. I'm going to call you beloved. I'm going to call you righteous. I'm going to call you holy. I'm going to call you all these things because that's what I'm doing in you. That's what I'm doing. But I'm doing it, Dennis. You didn't do it yourself. You understand what I'm saying? So if that's what I deserve, I deserve damnation in hell, and he's giving me forgiveness of sin, eternal life, a, a, a home with him, a, a child, being, becoming his adopted son, all of this, how am I to live life to bring him honor and glory in every decision and every thought? Now, I don't live that out perfectly. I still don't do that. But that's what you and I were created to do. So with that in mind, how are we going to live humbly before God? I want to just read you a couple of passages and we'll tie the bow on this thing. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 26. Paul's writing to us, and boy, I'll tell you what, I feel like he grocery lists me. You know, you go to the grocery store and you got butter and eggs and milk and you got the, well, he, he got me on the, the whole list. Okay, And I know he didn't have the full list. He just got me on every part of his list. Brothers and sisters, think what you were when you were called. Called to be one of his followers. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish, that's me, things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world to despise the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one Dennis Larkin may boast before him it is because of him that you are in Christ not me I didn't do this who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness holiness and redemption and then he says right in my face I feel like the gun is to my head therefore as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the Lord he described me foolish weak no nobility, lowly, that's exactly who I am. That's how I have been. And then he calls me favored, child, son, beloved. So what will I boast in? What will you boast in? Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm going to boast in that. You know, I, when, when people up front do what we do up front, like Paul and the team did up front, we thank them. Well, thank you. And, and, and rightfully so. Rightfully so, but boy, that was great. And, and, and when Pastor Bill preaches, you know, that was great. Thank you for that message. But, there, and we get this. We get people that will give us encouraging words, and, and those are right to do. But we can take the thank you and receive the glory. Or we can say, we're really, at least in our soul, even if we don't speak it out loud, no, God, that's you. You gave me the ability, and you gave me the privilege, and you gave me the opportunity, and all the glory goes to you. So whether... It's raising a child or working at your workplace or going out in the community and sharing Christ. Whatever it is that God has you doing and all those things in a sense is to give him the honor and the glory. I will boast in the Lord because God is good. Amen? Amen. Last verse, well, there's one more verse, but almost the last verse, Philippians 2. If you got your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to just jump on this one and, and kind of tie it together. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 3. Do nothing, Dennis Larkin, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves. Now the translation is consider others more important than yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but, re but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Boy, if there's anything that is a powerful, be like Christ. Have his mind. Think like Jesus would think. Do like Jesus would do. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being very nature God, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He... God of creation, the one who spoke the universe into existence and all that we understand right now, but from DNA to all that we see in the world, he spoke that all into existence. It says, and being found in the person of man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. If my God and my king humbled himself and I want to be anything like Jesus, I have got to live a life. This is continually humbling myself and letting people know I'm, I'm nothing. You, you see a gift or a talent or ability or you see something that the, the Lord has done, that is him doing it. He gave me ears that I can hear. 
He gave me eyes that I could see. He gave me a mouth that I can speak. He gave me, he did all of this. It's all him. He gave me the ability to understand. He's given me the ability to communicate. That's all his doing. And I'll take none of the glory. I'll take none of the honor. Because all I am is responding to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of all. That's all I'm doing. And that's all I really want to do. But there's times I want to touch the glory. There's times I want people to recognize Dennis. And that's when we get the mixed situations. So I titled this morning just the freeing power of humility. And then Pastor Bill asked me to kind of give a, a little byline. I just said, it's seeking to satisfy, seeking to satisfy pride brings destruction. If I want to fill in that thing, it just grows. Pride grows. Every time I feed it anything, it becomes a bigger monster. So if I feed it, man, it can, it can overwhelm me. Overwhelm me. But seeking to honor God brings life. And every time I honor Him, the pride thing diminishes a little bit, and diminishes a little bit, and diminishes a little bit more. Humility rejoices in God getting the credit. You know, you, you watch a American Idol on television or whatever, whoever it is, and they sing the voice or whatever. These people are remarkable, and you go, wow, wow. And we applaud, and we stand, we give them ovations, and we give them, yeah, but shouldn't we just be going, God, you're amazing. You gave that girl a voice. You gave that man a talent. What a skill you gave that person. Lord, you are amazing. You've given Paul a passion to music, and you've given him skills that he's worked on and developed, but God, you're amazing. Paul, he's good. You understand? You understand? And Paul, you, re you understand what I just said. I didn't dog Paul. But Paul's just Paul. But God gave him the ability to hear tones and notes and rhythm, and, and he's worked on that. It's obviously a skill set he's developed, but who do we give credit to, folks? Paul or God who created Paul and put a passion in Paul and gave him the abilities of Paul? Same thing with Pastor Bill. God has put so many wonderful things in Pastor Bill and in, and in Debbie. It's amazing things. But who gets credit? Boy, Pastor Bill, you're something else. Pastor Bill's heart puffs up. Puffs up. No, he's a humble man. This is a humble man. Last verse, we tie it up, is James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. I just want you to know that every time you bring him the glory and don't take the glory, he favors you. He favors you. He's up there. Good job, son. Good job, daughter. Good job, my beloved. You're walking this out humbly. You're not touching the glory. The glory belongs to the Father. Now, some of you may go, on, boy, I've really screwed up. My house is my house. My car is my car. My clothes are my clothes. My, bi my business or my... Sc I mean, it's me. It's mine. I earned that. Uh-huh. Yeah, you earned it with the skills and the talents and the abilities that the Father gave you. And you might be going, boy, whew, I struggle with this pride thing. Well, so do I. So God is the God of the second chance. And it's not just the second chance, it's the, second, the next second chance. The next second. He doesn't quit redeeming. So you may right now be going, I need to repent. Didn't do that. And if you're, if, this is a, if you're recognizing an area, by the way, any scenario you have, it's connected to pride, okay? Lust, connected to pride. Materialism, connected to pride. Ego, connected to pride. I mean, you name it, so you know what you struggle with. I know what I struggle with. I don't want to necessarily put them up on, on the screen right now for you all. But uh, we all know what they are, what we struggle with. So it's a pride issue in the bottom line. To go, God, I, I'm, I struggle. Then I want to suggest find a brother, men, find a sister, ladies, and go to him, her, say, you know, here's some of my struggles. This is, these are issues, and if you walk with me, I can walk better. If you'll keep me accountable, when, when my pride surfaces in whatever form it surfaces, materialism or whatever, it, when, when it surfaces, would you help me stay in check? I'm giving you permission to ask me and keep me in check, and I, and I want you to do that. Maybe they'll say, you know, I need that to be in check too. So right now, here's what I want to invite you to do. I want you to imagine that your sin is actually something you can hold in your hand. So I want you to reach your hand out right there. Look at your hand. Look at the palm of your hand. Your hand, not my hand. My hand is just... It's a hand. Look at your hand and think, okay, God, with your other hand, maybe place into it. Lust, anger, rebellion, pride, arrogance, materialism. Put them in there and look at them. And they say, God, this is all I got to offer you. Here's my stuff. It's not pretty. It's pretty messy. But I'm going to give it to you. And again, ask, redeem this. 
redeem this in me. Would you stand as we pray about my stuff and you pray about your stuff? Can we just pray about our stuff? So if you have stuff, if you have stuff, raise this, raise a hand that you have stuff that needs to be dealt with God. Okay, okay. Even my wife raised her hand. She's as perfect as I know. Okay, so she raised her hand too. You don't have to look at her, but then, then hold your stuff in the other hand. What it is, you know what it is. Hold it. And pray along with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my stuff. Forgive me of my pride and my arrogance, my self-fulfillment. My raising me up in one way or another to look good to somebody. The clothes I choose, the car I drive, the house I live in, the way I do what I do that is to make someone honor me. And Lord, I just want to confess and I want to repent. Lord, help us to be repentant, to be humble, to be like you, to put on humility, to allow you to clothe us in righteousness and holiness. That's what you do. Oh, so undeserving are we. But Lord, right here, you know our stuff, and some of us are, are afraid to even tell anybody what that stuff is. It's so secretive. And I'm asking right now for brothers and sisters in this room, God, you've given them the boldness and the freedom to tell someone their stuff. That we wouldn't pretend, I came into church this morning, I got it together. Because as far as I know, Jesus, you're the only one that ever had it together. So the rest of us, forgiven sinners as we are, still need to deal with our stuff. We don't want to grow old and become grumpy old men and sour old women. We want to be lovers of your soul as you are lovers, lovers of you as you're lovers of our soul, a lover of our soul, excuse me. So here's our stuff. Keep us aware of it. May we walk independently and together, humbly, with and before our God. You're the only one that really matters. And so we say to you, we love you. Our King, our Lord, our Savior, and the lover of our souls. To you belongs the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever and ever. And everyone said, Amen.